Our text this morning comes from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. The conversion of sinners is a subject of pleasing import. It is the deliverance of souls from darkness to light, from bondage to liberty, from misery to happiness, from death to life. Let him know, says the Apostle James, that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. To observe a moral change in anyone is a matter of joy. But when an avowed enemy to Christ becomes a zealous defender of the faith, our pleasure and gratitude are excited to the highest degree. This was the case with Saul of Tarsus. He once breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the cause of Christ, but afterwards became its most zealous advocate. At one time he was mad against the disciples of the Lord, persecuting them unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Afterwards, he called them brethren, dearly beloved and longed for. Thus, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It may not be amiss to observe that the Apostle Paul, in his missionary career, visited Philippi, a city of Macedonia. His preaching was not in vain, for Lydia and many others were converted, and a notable church was founded. None so readily supplied the Apostles' wants as they. At Thessalonica, they more than once gave full proof of their liberality, and also, when prisoner at Rome, they supplied his necessities. This latter contribution was sent to Rome by Epaphroditus, one of their preachers, by whom the Apostle returned a most affectionate epistle, wherein he declares his tender love of them, his care to prevent their stumbling at his sufferings, and his readiness to glorify God, either by life or death. He exhorts them to a strict holiness of life, to an imitation of Christ in humility, to activity and seriousness in their Christian course, to adorn their profession with suitable and mutual Christian graces. He warns them against false teachers and fellowship with wicked persons. And in our text, he most affectionately exhorts them to steadfastness in the Lord. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Favour me with your most sincere attention while we notice the interesting fact implied, the important duty enjoined, and the ministerial affection expressed. And may that eternal spirit, without whose aid we nothing good can do, assist me in speaking and you in hearing. Amen. First, the interesting fact implied, the Philippians were in the Lord. The scriptures of infallible truth declare that all mankind by nature are the children of wrath, that the whole world is become guilty before God, and that all have gone astray like lost sheep. Ungodly men are condemned by the law of God. They are under sentence of death. They are cut off from God, from his favour, and from communion with him. Your iniquities, saith the Lord, have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. If therefore any man be in the Lord, he must have been brought by divine grace out of his previous state of enmity and alienation. This is evident from the whole tenor of Revelation. Hence the people of God are frequently exhorted to call to mind their past condition and the way in which God saved them. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord redeemed thee. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence you are digged. The Apostle reminds the Ephesians that they were once dead in trespasses and sins, but that God in his rich mercy had quickened them. The Colossians were once under the power of darkness, but God translated them into the kingdom of his dear Son. The Philippians were without God and without hope in the world, when the great Apostle to the Gentiles walked by the riverside and preached the truth as it is in Jesus to the women who resorted thither. 
but they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered them, and thus became new creatures in Christ Jesus. A similar change must be experienced by us, or we shall forever remain strangers to that blessed state of enjoyment implied in our text. It is a melancholy fact that thousands think such a change unnecessary. Be it known unto such that they must be born again or die to all eternity. This is a subject, my dear hearers, that I have repeatedly enforced on your minds, but allow me once more to call your most serious attention to it. It may be the last time, therefore. Hear me, as if I were to leave this pulpit for the grave. It is more than probable that I shall never see you all again in this world. Our next meeting may be at the judgment seat of Christ. Hear me, poor sinner. I shall not trouble you much longer. I am about to leave you, but if you die unconverted, you will be a, a great trouble to yourself. Oh, may God in his great mercy visit and bless you at this time. I shall now endeavour with all plainness to make a few remarks on the glorious work of salvation or the conversion of blood-redeemed sinners. Before a man can be in the Lord, he must first have a deep sense of his lost and sinful condition by nature. The first step towards God is to be convinced that we are destitute of him. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. There are thousands lost who know not their sad condition, who are under the wrath of God, but feel not their misery. They imagine their Sodom of wickedness to be a paradise of pleasure. But the incantation of sin must be shaken from the souls of men. They must see plainly that they have been spending their money for that which is not bread, and their labour for that which satisfieth not. They must reflect on their past conduct with deep remorse. Therefore, they will seek rest in Christ. Those who are deeply convinced of their wretched state are led to exclaim, Where now, ye lying vanities of life, ye ever-tempting, ever-cheating train, where are ye now, and what is your amount? Vexation, disappointment, and remorse, sad, sickening thought, and yet deluded man, a scene of crude, disjointed visions past, and broken slumbers rises still resolved with new-flushed hopes to run the giddy round. Father of light and life, thou God supreme, O oh, teach me what is good, teach me thyself. Save me from folly, vanity, and vice, from every low pursuit, and feed my soul with knowledge, conscious peace, and virtue pure, sacred, substantial, never-fading bliss. Thus the awakened soul is led to cry out, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Save, Lord, or I perish. He brings forth fruits meet for repentance. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. He ventures his all on the atoning blood and believes with his heart unto righteousness. Hence to be in the Lord implies, secondly, the knowledge of salvation through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This inestimable blessing is received by faith in Christ. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Those who have thus believed have received the spirit of adoption, whereby they cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with their spirit that they are the children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Such persons can say, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Into this blessedness the Philippians were brought. They were in the Lord, in his favour, in his family, in his love, they were blessed with his special presence and constant protection. All true believers are grafted in Christ, the good olive tree. They are polished stones in God's spiritual temple. They are branches in Christ, the living vine. They are members of his mystical body. Their life is hid with Christ in God. Having thus noticed the fact implied, 
we shall proceed to consider secondly the important duty enjoined, stand fast in the Lord. The charge before us presupposes that the Christian is in danger of falling. Indeed, the most amiable Christians have need of warning and earnest exhortation against backsliding by temptation and deceivers. It is true the Apostle told the Philippians that he was confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in them would perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. But he was equally certain that they had no scripture ground to expect this salvation only in the use of the appointed means of grace. This is evident from the many warnings, cautions and exhortations which abound in the book of God, a few of which we shall cite. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Let us labour, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The exhortation given in our text implies the possibility of a good man maintaining his ground, notwithstanding the dangers to which he is exposed. He may be tempted to sin. Affliction and tribulation may, may be his portion. The love of many may wax cold. Men and devils may oppose him. But as his day is, so shall his strength be. God will never leave the faithful soul. My brethren, you may stand fast in the Lord. I entreat you to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Receive my charge. I speak to you, my children, whom the Lord has graciously given me. Steadfastness is indispensably necessary. It is connected with your happiness, usefulness and safety. Allow me now to remind you that to stand fast in the Lord is to abide in the doctrines, privileges and precepts of the gospel. Stand fast first in the doctrines of the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The leading doctrines which you have heard from me are the following, the innocency of man in his first state, the fall of man, general redemption by Christ Jesus, repentance, justification of the ungodly by faith, the witness of the Spirit, sanctification by the Holy Spirit, producing inward and outward holiness, the divinity or deity of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the general judgment and eternal rewards and punishments. These are the principal topics upon which I have dwelt during my ministry among you. And I rejoice to think that many of you have believed them. They have been made the power of God unto salvation, Hold fast your profession. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and rain, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Stand far secondly in the privileges of the gospel. The gospel is not only a system of doctrines to be believed, but a fullness of blessings to be enjoyed. It opens a storehouse of inexhaustible treasure, more valuable than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. All that we need as perishing sinners is made known to us in the bleeding love of a dying Saviour. The gospel of a crucified Christ is the word of salvation sent to bless the human family. It is the only infallible cure of human woe. Let us bind it to our hearts. What are nations without it? What are families without it? 
What are individuals without it? What were you when I first unfurled the blood-stained banner of the cross? Whither were you going when I first appeared in your streets and lanes, crying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world? You were as travellers without a guide, as sailors without a compass, as a sick man without a physician, as criminals without pardon, as sheep without a shepherd. But blessed be God, I can say, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Many of you have received the Holy Ghost. You are pardoned. You are regenerated. You are adopted into the family of God. You have the witness of the Spirit. You have fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You have divine power to support you, divine wisdom to guide you, and rich and constant supplies of grace to save you. Stand fast in these privileges. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Stand fast in the Lord implies, thirdly, a practical attention to the precepts of the Gospel. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ not only reveals doctrines to be believed, privileges to be enjoyed, but precepts to be practised. Believers in Christ are not outlaws. They are under the strongest obligations to be obedient to their Lord and Master, obligations flowing on streams of mediatorial blood. Christ recognises his obedient disciples as his friends. You are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. To mere professors he says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If ye are justified by faith in the blood of the Lamb, your light will shine before men. He that loveth God keepeth his commandments. He that says he loves God and liveth in sin is deluded by the devil. The design of our Saviour's manifestation in the flesh was to destroy the works of the devil. Everyone that nameth the name of Christ is required to depart from iniquity. They who profess the Saviour's name should from all sin depart. To save from sin the Saviour came. Lord, write it on each heart. My brethren, think on these things and hold fast that which is good. Be careful to maintain good works. Herein is your heavenly Father glorified if ye bear much fruit. Be diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Remember, the crown of life is promised only to overcome us. Stand fast in the Lord. Having thus noticed the duty enjoined, we proceed to remark third, the ministerial affection expressed. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown. Here observe, first, the affectionate appellation given, brethren. This term is sometimes applied to the whole human race. We are all of one family. In this sense, every man is my brother. God hath made of one blood all nations of men. Sometimes the term is applied to those of the same nation. Sirs, ye are brethren, why do we wrong one to another? Sometimes the term is applied to those of the same religion. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, peace be within thee. It is in this sense that we are to understand the term in our text. The saints are all brethren. Philemon the gentleman and Onesimus the slave are brethren. They are all begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They are all of the same spiritual family, the family of God and of the household of faith. They are one in Christ. They are all redeemed by the same blood, arrested by the same mercy, enlightened by the same spirit, justified by the same grace, adopted by the same love, supported by the same power. They are all dependent upon the same father, guided by the same book, tempted by the same devil, persecuted by the same world, 
sojourning in the same wilderness, walking in the same road, members of the same society, and looking for the same heaven. Thus, my brethren, you see your spiritual relationship. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ hath loved us, and hath given himself for us. These words pres present us, secondly, with the endearing terms of ministerial affection. Dearly beloved and longed for, see what a depth of affection is here displayed. Paul's love to the Philippians was stronger than death. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. It was ardent and sincere, constant and impartial. His language at all times was, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Dearly beloved and longed for, as I am about to leave you, deem it not arrogance in me when I say, I long greatly after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. I have not counted my life dear unto myself. I have spared no strength. I have shunned no cross. I have blenched at no persecution, nor hesitated in any difficulty. My love to you has been a constant flood tide. You are dear unto my heart. Most gladly would I spend and be spent for you. I first entered your towns and villages in love to your souls. I exposed myself to scenes of brutal violence, hot persecution, and constant reproach and slander on your account. I have risked my life repeatedly for your sakes. You are among the first fruits of my ministry. You are my present joy and will be my future crown of rejoicing in the day of Christ. Go on, my dearly beloved. Fight the good fight of faith. Endure hardships as good soldiers. I hope through grace to meet you all, where the parting sound shall pass our lips no more. For now I live, if you stand fast in the Lord. If ye love me, wound me not by want of love to each other, or by unfaithfulness in the cause of your dear Redeemer. My whole heart's desire and prayer to God is that I may meet you all in heaven. There are some present to whom I must particularly address myself. I mean, my respected brethren, the local preachers, you have stood by me in the good work. Continue in one mind. Remember that although you labour without any worldly remuneration, there is a heavenly reward waiting you. You shall reap if ye faint not. Never leave the field. Receive this as my last entreaty. Aim at saving souls in all you do. Preach the gospel and live it. Never lose sight of the doctrine of a present salvation. Receive my successors as from the Lord. Hold up their hands by fervent prayer. So shall your circuit rise, and many whom I now leave in the way to hell shall become the trophies of the conquering Jesus. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither laboured in vain. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all of them that are sanctified. There is a class of persons to whom I must speak a few words. I allude to impenitent sinners. I am now preaching my last sermon to you. Hear me, poor sinners. Hear me for the last time. Oh, what shall I say? Your heart's to move. What shall I say to rouse you from your slumber? Oh, for the aid of that spirit by which Peter spake, when thousands were pricked in their hearts, careless, Christless, prayerless souls. I found you in the way to hell, and must I leave you in it? I found you in the arms of the devil, and must I leave you there? Alas, alas, I leave you three or four years nearer hell than I found you. You are riper for damnation now than when you first saw my face. And oh, still more if you continue impenitent. 
and all the sermons, warnings, entreaties and invitations which I have given you will only serve to make the chain of your damnation stronger and the weight heavier that will sink you deeper and deeper into blackness and darkness and misery. Must I leave you in this awful state of impenitency? Oh, that I could weep tears of blood over your folly. But you must weep for yourselves. Weep now. Pray now. Believe now. The fountain is open. Wash and be clean. May the God of all mercy pluck your souls as brands from the burning. Amen and Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all. In Christ Jesus. Amen.